and uh, it was my screen still sharing it kind of dropped off okay Krishan uh, gave a little bit of background but I'll, I'll go into a few more details right now I am currently at uh, command commissioning and we are an engineering group up here in Dallas and in particular I'm in what uh, we branded ourselves as the building optimization group. So if you would go to our website, we have a page that kind of lays out what, uh, what we do. Um, the main core, the, the three headed monster of leadership is, um, is John Kimla, Ian and I, and we all had somewhat of a similar background in that we're all Aggies. And we took uh, what we've learned from the energy systems lab and we've, uh, we're applying that and we're we're out doing building optimization um, infrastructure projects and and my role is really the technical lead so uh, i'm more or less responsible for our group's technical output whether that's building energy modeling that's savings estimation that's some um, uh, mechanical design uh, that is my my role and, and so I really wear two hats. I, uh, I have a traditional mechanical engineering background. All of my degrees are in mechanical engineering, but during my time at AM, I also did software engineering. And I consider myself as a software engineer in a professional sense. And the, the software project that uh, I spent the most time in development is called CC Compass. And it's a, it's a web application that allows uh, energy engineers such as myself to do analysis of data from from buildings and so it's it's kind of a tool that uh, I use pretty much every day it's a uh, it's a uh, extremely powerful to to have your own tooling and I'm very proud to have worked on this project now going on for almost a decade so I've been programming in a professional sense uh, since about 2012 so I hope that uh, you can take what I say with some credence. I will also mention that, you know, we are also always looking for uh, talented individuals. I know I typically would speak to ASHRAE, the uh, Heating, Ventilating and Air Conditioning Engineers Society, but uh, we're looking for any uh, mechanical engineers that uh, would like to either um, start as an energy engineer or an internship that we offer. So we do summer internships and uh, we've had great success with that in the last couple of years. So again, that would be command CX dash careers, fill out this form and you can do that. So reproducible science. I pulled this quote from Wikipedia, uh, scientific research this is the scientific method. We're objectively trying to explain the events of nature. And if I could I, italicize the italics here, I would have uh, really brought out that last part there, reproducible way. Ideas need to stand up to repeated experimentation by others. But in our field, um, engineering analysis, when I, I'm talking about we have data, we're applying some uh, algorithms, we are doing some computation, we are analyzing it. It's, this really is, is easy to be inspected and should be repeatable, but it's not. Uh, for if you are, have a big research lab and you need an atomic microscope, that's one thing that makes replication hard. But if it's simply data and software, the, in my mind, there is no excuse for not being able to, to reproduce that. And I think that's something that's lost in a lot of the analysis that we as uh, scientists, uh, academics, and engineers uh, lose sight of. So this is important in, the, in an academic sense. If I'm writing a paper uh, or a thesis or a dissertation, I should be able from, from raw data get to my final outputs uh, at any point in time and, and be able to do that, uh, reproduce that. Anyone should be able to reproduce that, not just yourself. And in industry, clients really deserve to have access to the data, the analysis, and the results that you are doing for them. And I'll put at the, at the end here, this should be at any time in the project, including the past. So 
long-term projects, like the types of projects that we do in the building industry, they can last many, many years. Um, I, or our group should be responsible for, if someone looks at a report from two years ago and has a question about some results, some conclusion that was made, I should be able to reproduce that. That shouldn't be ad hoc and um, they, they deserve that. So reproducible engineering, I'm gonna break it down to two fundamentals. The first is version control, and the second is build systems. And we're gonna cover those in great detail today in this, uh, in this talk. And a driving mantra for myself, and if you would talk to any software engineer, is that anything that can be derived shall be derived. The, the ultimate go, goal with computers and automation is that you, you really want to get to the very, very base input, and that is, that is data. Anything that, can, that is a function of, of data or some sort of pipeline should be able to be automated, and that effort should be made. So, uh, you know, I, I assume we have a pretty varied audience here. Now, I, I structured this talk that the prerequisites should be fairly minimal. To meet that first foundation, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I use this as a, a bit facetious, but you've used a computer. Uh, in this day and age, there are enough uh, software tools out there and wrapper programs around the version control systems that it's really not an excuse to say, I don't know how to program. Uh, I can't version control my, my research or my, my work. So again, we'll show you, and I'm going to show you this on my computer live. We're going to start this up from the very, very beginning. And then two is build systems. I put, you've written a for loop. Okay. So a lit, the tiniest bit of programming uh, will allow you to build these automation pipelines. And if you haven't, say you have zero experience, that's okay. Um, part of this talk, I'm also going to try to give you very uh, targeted recommendations for where to start because it's a big world out there. And there's, it can be a little confusing on what's the best, best path forward. And uh, as someone who's try, tried many things, I know a lot of languages, I know a lot of frameworks, I can give you some, uh, some, some help to get started. So if you haven't programmed, what I usually tell my engineers who, who work for me is that Python uh, there are, with its flaws is still probably the best language to learn. It's cross-platform. Um, it's an interpreted language, so it's got a little bit simpler syntax. There's not much in terms of typing. Um, and it has a lot of libraries for doing the types of things that I assume this crowd would be doing. So that's going to be uh, machine learning, regression analysis, uh, dealing with big data. There's it's kind of a joke or a meme that there's a Python library for everything. All your hard work's already been done for you. So with that, we're gonna get started. And what I wanna do in this, this presentation is, is go through a live demo. So it's gonna be a lot less talking and a lot more of me typing. We're gonna go through from start to finish on a common workflow, which could be running a model on some data we're gonna analyze some results and then we're going to put those results into a final deliverable. Uh, that's either a paper or some sort of uh, technical report. And our particular example that we're gonna run, I'm going to run an Energy Plus simulation model. Energy Plus is a uh, building simulation tool. It essentially takes an input file that uh, describes our building and gives me how much energy that building is gonna, gonna use. We're gonna take that output that it gives us. We're gonna make a visualization. And then we are gonna build a paper. And I'm gonna show you two different ways. We're gonna use uh, LaTeX or a combination of uh, Markdown and Pandoc. And the basic steps uh, we're gonna go work through, I'm gonna start with where anyone would start, just no reproducibility and we're gonna build from there. We're gonna start then adding some version control to that. I'm gonna add a build script, and then we're gonna improve on that by using a build system. And actually I'm gonna to try to use three different ones to show you that even in an hour presentation, I can do this three times over. And then 
At the end, we'll discuss containerization. I don't think we'll have time for that. Also, containerization also is a little hard to do on a Windows computer, which I am using right now. So this is going to go some parts fast. Um, don't, uh, don't get caught up too much in the, the little details. Um, if you do have questions, again, use the chat. I'll try to monitor that on the side and uh, answer things as we go. Uh, so feel free to, to put things out there. Um, but uh, let's dive in. Yeah. And just to be clear, I'm on a, a standard Windows machine. So this is no different than what probably most of us uh, are used to. I'm probably going to use a few different uh, text editing tools that you may not have seen. But most of this is, is going to be source file uh, or text editing with source files. and uh, doing some compilation. So I'm going to build this project in this folder called Megzo Demo. And the first thing I want to do is imagine that I brought over some data. This is a, an input file. So if I open this file up, this is going to be Energy Plus. Again, imagine if you are not in my industry, you can imagine this is like a fluent simulation or some uh, FEA analysis. So let me, this is how I would normally um, open that up. This is a file that describes my building. Uh, so I, you know, it describes things such as the materials of the building. Uh, let's see, some heat gains from different people, etc. This is data. This is kind of the starting point. And once I have that data, I can use a, a program and we can go ahead and run this. So I'm going to simulate. This is a program that runs. Now I made, made this very small, but this, this process here can just imagine take five minutes. And if you're running a big FEA simulation, it could take an hour, more than an hour. Um, one annoying thing about this particular program is it produces a lot of uh, output. It kind of dumps it all here, but the uh, the main output that this produces is a CSV file with lots of stuff, and you know this will have some date times, and then it has the different output parameters. Now, in a normal normal workflow, I would go ahead and we'll call this you know my analysis. This is a some sort of worksheet. I'm going to put some data. Um, and let's say, you know, I don't necessarily, I'm not, I'm going to do something with this output. So I'm going to take this kind of set of temperatures here. I'm going to put it here. It turns out everything comes out in Celsius or SI units from that program. And I want to convert this to degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to do that. We'll turn it into that. I'm going to make a quick visualization. Again, this should all be, this is just kind of setting the stage for what a normal uh, workflow might be. So I'm going to make my plot. And then let's uh, let's make a Word doc my report dot txt. All right, we can you know my title, my heading, my analysis. Now. That, that's simple enough. And this is the, the, the bare minimum. This is what you've been doing. But if you can imagine this is a larger technical report or this is your dissertation or something like this, you're going to have more than one piece of analysis. There's going to be a lot more steps involved. And if I change something here with my raw data, I'm going to have to then open this program. I'm going to have to simulate it. I'm going to have to open up this CSV file copy and paste in here, and then copy and paste that into my, my Word doc. And that's where a build system comes in. What's also important is that let's say this was, uh, you know, 
my first draft of a, of, of a deliverable. We want to be able to now save this state that no matter what happens, say my Excel spreadsheet gets corrupted, that I can, I can get back to this. And so this is where we're gonna start with version control. So in the version control world, there are two major, well, there's one major player and that is Git. Um, if there is one piece of software or one um, something that you need to take away is that Git is important. Git is the only one you really need to know. <laughs> and uh, if you can take this presentation and do version control, then I've succeeded. Okay, so I wanna be clear that this is uh, probably the most important part of this presentation. And with Git is something called GitHub. And GitHub is the open source platform where people share the code. It's a, it's a code repository, but it's not the version control system itself. And again, a lot of people ask, how do I get started? And the answer to that is GitHub Desktop is what I would suggest. So GitHub Desktop, if you go to their website, focus on what matters instead of fighting with Git. Git is kind of notorious for having some, some quirks, but it is uh, the de facto standard for version control these days. And this makes things a lot simpler. So you can imagine you download that and let's, let's, uh, let's open this up. So when we wanna start a project that we wanna version control, we'll, we're gonna make a new, what they call a repository. So I'm gonna call this Megzo uh, sample project. Sample project for Megzo. And we're gonna put it in that uh, folder and we won't do anything. We'll talk about this Git ignore in a second. So I'm gonna create this. And if you see, we've got kind of this folder that we're gonna start putting stuff in for our project. So I want to, I'm gonna take all the stuff we've done thus far and we're gonna start version controlling this. All uh, right, I need to, Windows likes to complain about these things being open. So let me close these out. Okay. So now I've, I've started to build my project and I'm gonna start uh, putting some versions to this. So you can now see when I moved all those files in there, it automatically picked this up and it thinks, okay, you've added all of these files now to the project. Now, not all of these matter to me, so I don't really care about all of them. I can care about the CSV output. I care about my, my input file to my model. I care about my analysis and I care about my, my docx. And when you're at a point where you want to basically save a state, uh, what you do is a commit. So what we're gonna do down here is commit this and we're gonna give it a summary. I'm gonna call this rough draft. Uh, first pass at a draft. And then it's gonna say commit to main. I commit that in. And now if I look at the history of this project, there is some initial commit that was made for us and we can see the rough draft. And this will say in this commit, these were the things that changed. So that's not too interesting. Let's, let's for example, say now um, something, I got a new, uh, I have a new assumption about my model. So let's say in my materials, instead of 0.9 for my thermal absorp absorption rate, this is 0.7. So I'm gonna make a change. I'm gonna save that. And uh, we can rerun our simulation. Make sure that oh, I'm not a, this is the uh, I moved all these files. Sorry. This is the file. Let me modify that again. 
So I'm gonna make a change, 0.9 to 0.7. I'm gonna save that. And now you'll see that GitHub Desktop has picked up that there was a change and it is telling me exactly on line 241 of my input file that I went from 0.9 to 0.7. And so again, this can be another state where I'm, I want to make clear what changed in my project as things uh, as time has gone on. So I can call this uh, thermal absorptance um, adjusted. Key assumption in my model was wrong, period. Commit to main. And again, now in my history, I can go back and I can see that that is what has changed in my model. Now, at any point, I can get back to my original model or I can get back to any state previous. So if I really need to rerun this model here in this state and it was working, I can do that. Now, all of these things I've done thus far have been local to this machine. So the only special thing that makes this whole uh, version control work is this dot git folder. It's a special folder that git uses to track all these dependencies. You don't need to really usually do anything in here. Um, these, it starts with a dot. If you were more comfortable with a Unix system, these are called dot files. And normally these would be hidden when you do uh, like a ls command. Um, but on Windows, they're always going to show up. But uh, you usually don't have to, to mess with these. But the real power with, with Git as a version control system is that it's meant to be distributed version control so that lots of people can be working on the exact same project at the same time and not be getting in each other's way. So imagine if I was working with a colleague on this, they also could have been editing that same IDF file on their machine and we can work together to, to build uh, a final product. Same thing with the analysis or our report. Now, the way you're going to be able to share this is that you are going to push this code to some common repository. And the repository that, again, has become the, the standard in the industry is uh, GitHub. And GitHub Desktop integrates directly with GitHub, as you would expect, it's uh, from the same people. Um, I can go ahead and click this publish repository and this is going to publish the repository to GitHub. So um, GitHub, again, is a repository. So if I just go to the main, main homepage, okay, well, this is gonna take me to my personal profile, but you can see I have lots of repositories going on here and we're gonna make a, make a new one. I'm gonna call it that Megzo sample project publish. And if I go now to my repositories, I should see that. So I see Megzo sample project, and here are the files that I committed. I can see, again, the same commits. I can click any of these and see all the changes that have gone on. Now, GitHub provides a whole slew of other features. You can do, uh, for bigger software projects, you can do issues management. Uh, you can have a wiki for your project. You can do uh, lots of lots of cool things. But what this allows you to do then is on anybody else's computer, they can get all these files in this exact pristine condition that you've left it by cloning that repository. And then they can go ahead and work on it and they can also push up. So again, to summarize, the basic workflow is you make a repository, you put stuff in it. When you're at a state that you want to save things, you commit that. And then when you want to share or you want to uh, back these things up, you push it up to the main repository and then others can get access to that. And that's, that is the, the, the basics of version control. Now, in, in a technical uh, in industry here, we will typically on any sort of deliverable when there's a, a report that's sent out, we will have a commit with that so that 
not only when that report goes out, I can get back to the exact state it was, if it's a Word doc or something like this, but I also have all of the analysis, the spreadsheets and the data that was used to, to create that report is all there. And at any point I can get back to it and know that that is absolutely 100% the same files. And the magic behind all this is uh, gonna deal with cryptographic hashes of files and things like this. Um, but to get started, you don't need to know any of that. You just need to kind of know the basics of a program like this, like GitHub Desktop. Now, uh, a couple other just nice things to know about Git is that uh, you have the ability to ignore files that you don't care about. So for instance, all of these Energy Plus kind of outputs, I don't need to version control right now. You can ignore those using a file that's called git ignore. And again, it's a dot file. On Windows, it's a little tough to make because Windows wants you to put an extension. So uh, it doesn't have an extension. So if you put a period at the end, it'll tell you. But if it's, essentially, this is just a, a, a text file. So I can open this with notepad. And what you do is you can specify uh, some of the, uh, the patterns of the files that you want to ignore. So I kind of have this, I have an example here. So anything that ends with audit, BND, EIO, ER, ESO, all this stuff I uh, want to ignore. So I'm going to save that, close that. And now when I come back here, you can see all those files that ended with that have kind of disappeared. And apparently cooling tower meter.csv, we could also get rid of that if we want. So that's a the, the git ignore file. Okay. Uh, I also want to just give you a sense of like, we have a very small example here of three commits. Um, Git is been battle tested. Um, I mean, a little bit of the history is that it was created as the version control system for Linux. Uh, if you're not aware of what Linux is, it's probably the most important OS kernel. You know, you could debate it with, you know, the Mac OS kernel or Windows kernel, but um, they ran into problems with old version control systems. So they wrote one from scratch to meet their needs. And you can see how many commits have been made to the Linux kernel. It's almost to a hundred or almost to a million commits by fi over 5,000 people. So uh, Git is a serious program. Uh, it can handle pretty much anything you throw at it. It's obviously best, uh, works best with um, things that are text files at heart because it'll be able to tell you what the diffs between files, but it still works with uh, binary files such as a docx or a, uh, or a, um, like a spreadsheet like Excel. And we can just quick sh and quick show that. So let's say on this report, This is now my title, version two. This is now our final deliverable. You can see that this showed up. You know, it's a, a docx is, is, is actually a zip file at heart. So it's gonna be a binary. It's not gonna be able to tell you exactly what line you changed in here, but you can still version control this. I can still say, um, you know, final report, final report for clients commit, push, refresh, final report. Okay. All right, so let me take a, a little quick look at some of the questions I had here. Um, Dr. Culp, I, let me come back to that to some of the job skills that we're looking for uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, change update tab can see history tab. Is it possible if user delete any data under the history tab? Yes, so let's say for instance, um, someone deletes this, my analysis Excel spreadsheet, that will show up as a deletion here as well. So you can be 
it's clear if somebody uh, totally eliminates a file and you can remove files from version control as well. Though, if say I remove this, I can always go back in history and if it was there at any point, I can get that file back. So almost anything you can think of is rever revertible. You really, once it's been committed to history, uh, it's very difficult to uh, mess things up. And that's what can give you confidence uh, in, in making changes to a project, especially things that may be a, fin a bit finicky to get set up. Can you delete the history? No, not really. Um, I mean, technically you can do some rewriting of history, but that's usually not how uh, a tool like this is, is meant to be used. It's meant to capture from the very, very first state till the present uh, what you've done. But it, it, it technically it is possible, but that's not uh, how it should really be, be used. For the git ignore file, it was asked to use regular expressions. It's more like a, a traditional glob syntax. So you don't have full regular expressions at your disposal. You have a star wildcard, you have a, a, a the question mark. Um, and again, what we had in what we had in ours, we were using that wildcard, the, the asterisk to capture anything with these extensions. You're welcome. Okay, so that is what I wanted to cover with uh, version control. And so the next part is going to be talking about build systems and build scripts. So again, we had this workflow of I make a change to my input file, I run the simulation, I take the data, I make the plot, I then copy and paste it into my report. And really, all of that can be automated except for the change of the raw data in my input file. So I should be able to automate that process. And I'm gonna show you a bit of a few of the tools that uh, I would use or recommend to do such a thing. So like I mentioned before, the, the language that's cross-platform probably easiest for most people to get started with is Python. So a lot of what I'm gonna to do to get started is in Python. Um, and, but this can be done in virtually any sort of uh, programming language. Oh, the, one second, the lights turned off on me in the, <laughs> okay. All right. There was a quick question. Can we use it with MS Word and PowerPoint files? Yes. So like I just kind of showed that example, but you won't be able to see the exact difference in files. All right, so I'm going to be using uh, a shell to do a lot of this, but don't get too caught up in the semantics. I'm essentially just editing files. So you can use, for Python, uh, you can use uh, PyCharm. There's lots of different editors out there, Jupyter Notebooks, um, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it here. So let's, uh, I'm going to... Let's see. I'm going to change into our project that we had. So just to be clear, I'm in this folder with these files, and we're going to try to automate the, the process of making a report. And I'm not going to make a docx at this point. What I'm going to show is how we're going to uh, we're going to use uh, Energy Plus to get our CSV. I'm going to use Python to process the CSV. I'm going to use a program called Matplotlib to make my visualization. And then I'm going to use LaTeX as my report generation and kind of show that whole pipeline, how we can, we can go from raw data entry all the way to our final deliverable. So I'm going to start. And again, this is where it gets, gets interesting, folks. We're doing a live demo. All right, so we're going to do some processing. So the first thing that I want to do is to be able to basically run that energy plus simulation. Now, it turns out you don't have to use that GUI. That GUI is a wrapper around a, an executable that installs when you have energy plus. So I will show you what some of this means here in a second.
what that means is that I could have run energy plus just like this from a shell environment. You can imagine you also could do this from uh, the command prompt. I can put energy plus .exe and I can run the simulation here. And this again, this is just an engine at this point. It takes an input file, uh, it's a text file, and it produces all those other files you saw, including the CSV that we wanted. And so I can run that simulation uh, directly from here uh, using a command like this. You can see it does its thing and I got all my output. So we're gonna do the same thing in Python. And that's what this, uh, this subprocess command here is doing. So it's essentially, it's running that program. And that's pretty much anything on any sort of computer, Windows, Linux, whatever, what you're doing is you run a program with arguments and we're just gonna compose those together and build steps to get our final output. So after we've done this, this step, we have that output CSV. So now what I wanna do is take the data out of that CSV. So I'm gonna use a library called, uh, or import CSV, this is built into Python. Um, I'm gonna just initialize an array. We're gonna open that CSV file. We plus out CSV. This is a string. Okay, so we've we've opened the file. I'm gonna get the let's get the raw data out of here. CSV.reader. So we've essentially read that file into raw data. It's basically a, an array of strings at this point. So we need to kind of process that a little bit. Again, if you don't know Python, that's okay. This should just be a little, um, a little peek into what kind of the syntax looks at it. Uh, that first row has a header, so I'm kind of skipping. That's what this one colon does. I'm slicing that and that first column was temperature in Celsius. I need to convert that. If, and then there was some weird stuff with it. Uh, the first couple columns were below zero. So I'm gonna eliminate those. And we're going to do our little transformation that we did last time. We're gonna go temp Fahrenheit, temp Celsius, nine fifths plus 32. And then we are gonna go data dot append temp Fahrenheit. Okay, so at this point, I've opened that CSV file, I've put it in some data, and now it's gonna be ready for uh, put making some visualization. So what I'm going to show is something called matplotlib. This is a useful library. So if you're looking for some tool to make plots, this is one that I would recommend to, to new users. The question was, what editor am I using? This is NeoVim for those who are interested in, in text editors. And that was telling me that that is syntax error. So what I need to do is I need to uh, import in matplotlib. So I'm gonna get my and they usually recommend importing it like this. Now, the one gotcha with Python is that the package management or how to deal with libraries is very, very confusing. So I will give you all another helpful hint of how to get started with that. And the what I would typically use is what is called pip env. So this will help you install libraries that you need and and kind of keep your projects tidy. So uh, you may come across things called virtual environments. This is kind of a higher level wrapper around that. So I need to install that library quick. And this is going to help me do that. All right. So 
and then just uh, so that it knows that I'm using that. All right. So now we have our plotting library. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining all the syntax, but just know that I am going to use that library to plot my data. And that's what this one command does. And then I'm going to save that figure to a file. Save fig to e plus out dot png. Uh, and we'll just make sure it's got the right format equals png. So I should now be able to run this script. It will run my energy plus, and then it should have made that uh, that PNG. So let's uh, let's just take a look at this folder, and there we go. There's the PNG. It doesn't look like it uh, put any data in it. That's okay. So we have a we have an image, and now we want to um, we want to put that in a report. So the next step of this process is going to be defining a uh, a LaTeX input file. So we're going to show we're going to show that as well. So let's go. Be, I'm going to call it my report. LaTeX again. LaTeX got a lot of things going on for it, but essentially has some kind of syntax that looks like this. Um, I can, I'm gonna put my name in here. Uh, we can make a title, my amazing paper. We can put an abstract. We can say, you know, this paper is definitely going to get me that postdoc. <laughs> and then we can include our image in here. Now, the way you way LaTeX typically works for those of you who are not aware, again, this is another simple thing where you have a program that has an input file and it just compiles to an output. So in LaTeX world, there's actually multiple compilers, which is what's also kind of confusing for, for newcomers. There's three major ones. There's PDF LaTeX, Lua LaTeX, or XE LaTeX. And again, I would recommend Lua LaTeX. So if I run that, that essentially took that tech file. And again, if I open up this folder, I now see my report. So I had my abstract. This is going to get me my postdoc and my uh, and my figure. So again, we similar to how we did up here, we can do the final step of our build script and I can put in here, Lua LaTeX, my, my report.tech. And that will run from start to finish. Now we'll run the model, process the data that came out of it, make the figure, and then make my final document. And we can, uh, I didn't, we can type, I didn't make the title even in here. So let me, so what does it make title? Make, make title. There's a few other things in the tech, like uh, if you're looking for, you know, how things look, this would be italics, things like that. So it's text, uh, uh, it's kind of verbose, where I'm going to kind of probably show you what I prefer as a better way nowadays. but. Um, a lot of scientific documentation is, is done this way. And what is nice about it is that, again, because it's now just another file in my pipeline, I can now generate parts of this file. I can reference other parts of this file and it can, can all flow from start to finish. And it has a, a really nice uh, output at the end. So let's just build this from start to finish. And so if I scroll back through this output, you saw it started with energy plus, it ran my model. In between here, it would have made my figure. And then this is now for LaTeX. And if 
I look at this report, now I see my amazing paper. Here's some paragraphs in italics and I abstract in my figure. So that's that's cool. That is the first step. And I would call this a build script. So what's nice is also that when I now put this into version control, anyone can essentially read this and be able to kind of reverse engineer, how did I get from start to finish? I can look at the top, oh, they ran a model, then they process it, and then they ran the report. But there's some downfalls with that. And that, let's say that first part of that didn't take 30 seconds or, you know, two seconds, but took 30 minutes, right? I don't, every time I want to build my report or get a new report, I cannot wait 30 minutes for this thing to run. And, and so what build systems now add is an ability to only build what you need at the given time. They track dependencies to know what thing depends on what each other. And if the dependencies have not changed, then I don't need to rebuild them. And then build systems also offer big performance boosts when you're talking about compiling large projects, because if you know how things are created from a dependency tree point of view, I can now parallelize this build. So if there are things that don't interfere with each other, I can do them at exactly the same time and I can improve the performance uh, drastically. Tell me how to get started. I'm gonna give you three suggestions and we'll kind of go over this uh, here. I'm gonna be probably really crunched for time. So um, we'll probably only get probably through the do it and make, but the three that I would suggest are make, redo and do it. Uh, make is the oldest of the three. It's been around for probably 30 years. <laughs> it's uh, it's typically going to be used in the the Unixy world. And for instance, the Linux kernel is actually compiled using Make. And we'll see here in a second. But Make is basically a, a domain specific language, and you type in how to build your project in what's called a Make file, and then you can you can build. Um, the other ones that I want to show are do it. So this is a really nice one because it's also, if you become familiar with Python, you want to kind of live in this whole environment. Uh, do it gives the power of build tools to ex execute any kind of task. So this is a great build tool. And if you want to do this on Windows, because a lot of things here are going to be a little easier on a, on a Mac or on a, uh, a Unix type machine. And then redo, and redo is actually the one that I use uh, for the most part, um, a recursive general build, general purpose build system, a competitor to the long live, but sadly imperfect make program. Make has been around forever. It's never gonna go away. So, you know, it's useful to understand uh, make, but it's not necessarily the easiest to use. So again, I would recommend either do it or redo as a, as a build system. Okay, so, Let's look at some of these questions here. Um, <laughs> what did I use to make my presentation? Yes, it is called reveal.js. So let's let's now we are gonna split this this build script into three different pieces. You have your model you have your processing, and then you have your reporting. And each part depends on the previous step. So before I can analyze, I have to run my model. But once I run that model once, I'm good. And so we can build up a bit of a dependency tree for that. So for do it, again, this is Python. Um, you essentially define tasks using pretty simple syntax. Um, I'm going to define a tax called energy plus, and this is going to be the first step of our build system. So there's a couple things you got to define dependencies, what you're going to do and what it's going to output, and then maybe some documentation. So what does it depend on? Well, it depends on that cooling tower input file. What do I need to do to run it? I uh, do the same thing I did before energy plus exe, and then I need some of these other 
uh, arguments to go along with it. And what this what this makes for me is that CSV file that I wanted, right? So that defines a task. That's a, this is one part of the pipeline, and then I can now see what things I can do, and now I can do it, <laughs> and that runs that that task. Now, if you saw the second time I ran it, it ran extremely fast. And it had a little different symbol. Here it had a period and here it had the double dashes. That's because after I ran it once and I made that file, it knows that that file already exists that I really don't need to do anything. So it just kind of skips, skips that process. So that's, that's very cool. Um, we can then go ahead and uh, add our make tasks make png and this is going to depend on this file and what i want to do real quick is um, i need to copy something So I'm, I, I slightly changed that that part that makes the uh, the PNG because I want to be able to to do it on any input file or output file. So now this is just a Python script that expects two arguments. You give me the CSV file, and then you tell me where you want that that PNG to go. So we can now, and I'm going to use. Uh, run, uh, let's see, Python, make fig, it's my Python file, I need to give it the two arguments that I expected before. It's gonna be the input is this CSV file, and the output's gonna be that PNG file. So now, if I list out what I can do, I can either run the model or that PNG, but you can see because the one references the other, it's gonna try to make the energy plus model first, and then it makes the, the figure. And I can show you there. Now, now the figure's here, okay. So I'm just defining tasks. Um, and then we can then run them and reference them. But when I run things a second time, it's gonna use that information from before to speed things up. Now, I'm gonna be probably running out of time here. So what I do want to, to show is instead of LaTeX, using something called Markdown and Pandoc to also make a, a presentation or some report. So Markdown is a, simplified uh, markup language. And then Pandoc is a universal document converter. And its, it's real power is that it can take this kind of syntax and then produce out a PDF or a docx or HTML. It can do all of that. And so this is actually the way that uh, I personally make a lot of documentation and technical reports here. So I'm going to call this my report dot md is the typical uh, syntax for markdown and it has a very simple format in terms of whoa, like uh, markup so you can make a heading losing this pound sign i can say here is a paragraph uh, here's italics here's bold 
subheading, I can put in uh, code. And then I can also reference and put a figure. So I can say figure caption, and we can put in uh, that uh, PNG that we had. And what's nice then is you can use a tool like Pandoc to turn this into um, reports. So I'm going to call this new report.pdf, and I'm going to give it the argument of that markdown file. This should be successful. All right, thank goodness. And if I open up my new report, you can see I get something that looks pretty similar to the output I had before, but it doesn't have all that sort of boilerplate LaTeX stuff. I'm not, I don't have a ton of using packages and all these command macros. It's a very simple markup language. And so if you basically need the, the bare basics of reporting, a headings, old uh, italics, uh, code, tables, figures, uh, markdown to an end result is extremely powerful because I can also then, um, instead of a PDF, I can go to uh, docx. And so I can see this. Here's that file now in uh, word form, same same exact thing. Now you can apply your own styling to this. So we have our own styling templates, and so we can write very simple uh, report, you know, documentation in Markdown syntax, and then have it compile to a format that uh, meets our design standards. You know, our colors, our formats, all of that. And again, because now that's a just a simple file, I can actually programmatically build that. And so for something that uh, is like a generated type report, that's very easy to do because you can very easily, you know, make these figures and reference them in a file and then put them all together and make a big final output. Um, so again, very powerful, the combination of Markdown and Pandoc. This uh, again, also, it's got so many different outputs, we can even make a a simple web page out of this as well. All right. The final step. So we've kind of we've moved from build script. We talked about build systems. I didn't get to go as many as I wanted. I'm just going to be out of time. Uh, the final step here is to understand that it may have looked pretty easy for me to uh, run some of these commands. And, and part of that was because I already have an environment that is already set up. I already had Energy Plus installed. I already had all of my Python stuff installed. I had um, Pandoc installed. And if I just sat down at a new computer, before, before I could run that build script, I would need to get all of these things in place. And this is where containerization comes in. And containerization is kind of a new phenomenon. It's uh, really exploded in the last three years, but essentially the, the quick and dirty way to think about it is you are wrapping everything up um, for a given application, including the operating system and all the programs within it. So I can essentially describe in a file what OS I'm on, what software is installed on that OS, uh, a couple of different programs, and then I can run uh, and and get my output. And the only then the only dependency that someone else needs is the program to run that that container that container they call it. And the big player in that market is uh, is called Docker. So um, their kind of main tagline is how you build, share, and run modern applications. What is a container? Again, it wraps up. Um, a code and all dependencies, other programs that it uh, relies on, the OS, the system of your environment, and puts it all together. And so you only need one dependency, which is Docker. And then you can go to Docker Hub, and you can put this out for other people to use, and you can these containers can build on themselves. So I could even look up, I'm sure there's a Energy Plus container from NREL, 
which would allow me basically to run Energy Plus without it even being installed. All I would need is, is Docker and uh, you, can, you can use that. And I could build that into my pipeline and all these things. Now that's a bit advanced again. You, you start small and you move you work your way up. Start with version control, and then automate a couple of the, the painful parts, and then use a build system to speed things up so you don't have to repeat work that you don't have to do. And then if you get to a full-time software project, you may think about containerization. I'm a little over time. So the last, I'll just leave you with a couple other cool things to explore on your own time. Um, what got me into kind of some of this world is a software called Overleaf, which took all the pain points out of uh, document creation for, uh, and this is for, again, LaTeX. And I, I just opened this up. I haven't used this in two years, but I can still see this is all here. Um, if any of you uh, have taken Dr. Claridge's class or anything like that, um, you know, some of the solutions were done in this web interface for doing it. It simplifies all the compiling. Essentially, you write your code here, you get your output on the right side. So if you're interested in just the, the, the most simple way to get started with this, I recommend uh, Overleaf. Um, Docker for containerizations. I kind of glossed over it, but what I was running here is called the Windows subsystem for Linux. So this gives me basically all of my Unix style tools. It gives me two operating systems in one. So I, I operate in a Windows environment that's never gonna go away. I still, Windows is certainly great for lots of things, um, but there are other things that uh, a Unix type shell is gonna be much better to do, especially for things like building these pipelines. And so, I recommend looking into the Windows subsystem for Linux. And then just a, a shameless plug for my own stuff. I have uh, a, a blog. I have a couple websites. Uh, I have one for doing psychometric charting, psychometric formulas, and I have a, uh, a YouTube channel as well um, if you guys are more interested in this, uh, some of the stuff that, that I work on. And uh, that was Whirlwind. So, Again, I hope you all took something away from that that you hadn't been aware of. Uh, if, if you're new to this game, you got a few recommendations for getting started um, that hopefully keep you from getting too tripped up. But and if I get some of you to learn how to download GitHub desktop and version control, some technical reports, I have succeeded. And uh, I can say that this was a great success. So with that, I will finish and I will open up for questions. All right, I see one question in the chat. Do you, do you use any continuous integration tools? Um, in our in my work, uh, we do some, but not as much as we should. Uh, so what continuous integration tools, uh, if you hear that term, that would, well, that would be something like when I push to this repository, that it automatically would run a series of tests to test that code that just got pushed. So this is really important on large software projects to know that when somebody has made a change that we haven't broken anything and we wanna be diligent about it, that every check-in gets, gets checked, that's called continuous integration. And then there's another part which is called continuous deployment where um, as code comes in, it actually gets bundled up and if it passes all the tests, it actually gets deployed out and, you know, this is um, there's some this is kind of a new philosophy, and there's whole um, DevOps is a whole industry related to to this. Can you tell me more about the Linux subsystem for Linux? How are you using it on Windows? Yes. So um, the easiest way to get started is to go to the Windows Store, and you can type in. I think Windows subsystem or Linux. And I think you should get a whole bunch of distributions that you can choose from. Mm. That's probably not the greatest search. The one that most people start with and probably is the most long running is uh, Ubuntu. So you can go here, 
click this, uh, install. There's, there's a, I think you have to, yeah, you have to turn on one feature in Windows, but you, you kind of follow this quick one paragraph instruction. You press OK and you're off and running. But I would also recommend that if you do try this, that you pair this with uh, the Windows terminal. So this is a much better terminal environment. So this is basically replacing this console. Uh, Microsoft basically said, this console is too important. Um, you know, there could be some oil rig up in Alaska that half the you know, oil pipeline depends on, you know, having some weird bug in this command prompt. Uh, and so they were having difficulty making any sort of progress and changes to this. So they decided to, they keep this and they do have this, but they, they built what's called the Windows terminal from scratch using some modern technologies. And that is actually what this window here is. So again, the, the interface is terminal and that's Windows terminal and the uh, the, the shell or the code I'm running here is Ubuntu, and that's on the Windows subsystem for Linux. Any other questions? Are you supposed to include the container within your GitHub repository? No, what you would include is what's called the Docker file, which kind of defines defines the container. And I don't know if I can see if I can find an example. Get a, I think this. Yeah, I don't have an example for you, but. Yes, yeah, so what you would version control is the actual Docker file, which uh, kind of explains what makes up the container. I, I would do want to circle back to uh, Dr. Culp's question, which was talking about job opportunities in our industry. Um, building the building and energy industry is booming; it's not going away, um, and there's lots of technical expertise that is needed. Um, you know, you know, I uh, thoroughly enjoy the com the complexities that that come with uh, with buildings, and you get also a little bit of the uh, you're saving the world. You know, buildings are forty percent of the uh, energy use out there, and the most cost effective way to to kind of help reduce that is through energy efficiency. And a lot of that is analysis, modeling, engineering, design, all of these skills that that we need, and the skills that you know, in our group that we typically look for are obviously your mechanical engineering fundamentals. So thermo, heat transfer, mechanics, things like that. But also, it's also very critical these days that you have programming skills. And again, these things that I presented today are big pluses. I, all of these students that typically come under me through internships, I will certainly expose them. And I hope that they come out of this their experience with these types of skills that they can apply. And these are, again, skills that apply for anything. Any sort of analysis that you do in any field, you can version control them, you can build them, you can use software to take your skills to the next level. What tools do I use to develop and build your software? Uh, anything and everything and the right tool for the job. Um, for the uh, the main uh, per piece of production software that uh, that uh, I write this web application, this is going to be um, it's all sorts of different technologies, but it's back end is C sharp, front end's HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Um, the SQL Server database, um, so a little bit of everything. Uh, in terms of other analysis, again, I use Python quite a bit. Um, a lot of sh a lot of small shell scripts to get things done quick and easy. Uh, I really like awk for getting uh, quick analysis done. Um, I've ventured into the functional programming world with Haskell. Uh, and then I've even written my own uh, programming language for doing energy plus. So a little bit of a little bit of everything.
Do you have any other questions? I just want to mention if anybody wants to drop out, that's fine. I know we are over time. Uh, I, I will send out the um, recording of this presentation. But yes, if sir. you have more questions, uh, please uh, answer, ask now. Yeah, I will, I will stay on until the last person is off. <laughs> My wife has the, the baby for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Anil. Let me uh, If there are no other questions, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Paulus, for giving this great presentation. Uh, I hope everyone learned something from this, uh, even though we went a little bit over time. Um, uh, I will be sending out an exit survey soon after this uh, presentation, and please complete if you all get a chance it will be helpful for us to improve uh, future events. Any last questions? I got one. What do I think about Django? Never used it. Sorry. <laughs> no, no feedback. Was it, uh, no, I, uh, again, I'm, I'm in the industry at the moment. I'm, there's may come back for uh, the academia, but no, I'm not, uh, I do not, I never was a post, well, I guess technically I am in a postdoctoral position, but uh, not in the traditional sense. You're welcome. Mitch, a very nice job. I appreciate your your time and your intelligence. <laughs> Spread the good word. <laughs> we have Luke. We have Luke's camera finally on. <laughs> yeah, I had to jump to the other setup. I don't know what was going on with my personal computer, but it was not too happy about Zoom today, so I had to do some shuffling. Mitch, I need to head back to my class, so. This was a nice break. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good to see you, Dr. Cobb. It's good to see you too. All right. I guess, uh, thank you, Dr. Paulus. Thanks, thanks for- uh, Yeah, thank um, you very much, Dr. Paulus. Give me mine, Luke. Anytime you want a presentation, I got one ready. Yeah, I'll probably send one and we'll try and coordinate something for the ASHRAE branch over the summer. Um, I need to nail down what they're doing for their virtual summer conference stuff, but I'm sure I'll, I'll pull your details from uh, Kushan's announcement and I'll send you an email. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. All right. Take thank care, you. everyone. All right. Thanks and gig them. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye.